Today on Metal Talk Monday, I'm going to review every single Metallica studio album from Kill 'Em All all the way to 72 Seasons. We're only going to do studio albums, so no in-depth talk about Beyond Magnetic, Garage, Aim, No Life to Leather, stuff like that. And we're going to go back to where it all started, but first... It's Metal Talk Monday with your host, Van Henson. Metallica was formed in 1981 after Lars Ulrich placed an ad in the newspaper looking for band members. Lars had talked to Metal Blade Records and asked to record a song for the compilation album Metal Masker. With them giving a yes on the project, he recruited James Hetfield from the newspaper and with him came leather charm bassist Ron Guffney. Dave Mustaine also answered the ad and was recruited. Although Dave Mustaine was now Metallica, the Metal Masker album would feature Lloyd Grant on guitar now. The second pressing of Metal Masker features Dave Mustaine on lead guitar, though... I think. I, I don't know why, it's confusing as fuck. Let's skip ahead now to 1982. Ron Govney leaves Metallica after having fallouts with Dave Mustaine and Lars Ulrich, and in steps the legendary Cliff Burton. In 1983, Dave Mustaine is fired from Metallica, and we already know what becomes of that. Dave is replaced by Exodus guitarist Kirk Hammett. Cool fact, Kirk Hammett was one of the founding members of Exodus. Some speculate that Gary Holt replaced Kirk Hammett in Exodus, but he was actually already there at the time Kirk was in. It was actually Kirk Hammett that taught Gary Holt his first few chords on guitars. Anyways, I'm getting off track. So now we have James Hetfield as singer and rhythm guitar, Kirk Hammett on lead guitar, Cliff Burton on bass, and Lars Ulrich on drums. And that's how the band would stay until 1986. Kill Em All, Metallica's debut album released in 1986. The tracks are Hit the Lights, The Four Horsemen, Motor Breath, Jump in the Fire, Anesthesia, Pulling Teeth, Whiplash, Phantom Lord, No Remorse, Seek and Destroy, and Metal Militia. Hit the Lights starts off with raw thrash aggression, mentioning no life to leather, and it's just balls to the wall intensity. The Four Horsemen, one of the very first tracks that was mainly written by Dave Mustaine, and it was originally called The Mechanics. You can hear Mustaine's version on Megadeth's debut album, Killing Is My Business. Personally though, I prefer The Four Horsemen's lyrics. I just think they're cooler. In fun facts, We Home Alabama is in the song. Mustaine added it after hearing Cliff Burton jam out to Leonard Skinner. You can definitely hear it in the bridge of the song. Motor Breath. When I hear this song, it reminds me to just keep living and taking opportunities to grow and experience life. Jump in the fire. I love the bass rumble on this song. Metallica isn't really known for doing songs about hell, but this one seems to be. I remember seeing shoes for this song one time and I thought it was fitting. Lace them up and jump into the fire. Anesthesia pulling teeth. This is a bass solo. Take one, actually. Intro kind of always reminded me of that one section in Don't Fear the Reaper by Blue Oyster Cult. This is Cliff Burton just shredding and showing his skills. You'll notice the raw distortion and just chunky, shreddy bass. Cliff really treated his bass like an electric guitar, and he was damn good. Plus, this is a nice transition into the next song, Whiplash. The intro to Whiplash sounds like an 80s Iron Maiden song that's about to kick off, and then it goes into some palm mute chug. It's back to the thrashiness that Kill 'em All is great for. Plus, the song says fuck, which is something that Metallica doesn't do a lot in their songs. Whiplash! Phantom Lord. I love this song. It's one of my favorites from the album. Crushing metal strikes on this frightening night, fall onto your knees for the Phantom Lord. I want to know that James Hetfield was in a band called Phantom Lord before Metallica, so I feel like this is somewhat of a love letter? Maybe not. I don't know. But anyways, I love the intensity that the song delivers. You can hear elements of the song in This Was My Life by Megadeth, as again, Dave Mustaine shares writing credits on Phantom Word. But I'll get more into that in a little bit. No remorse. No remorse, no repent, we don't care what it meant. Another day, another death, another sorrow, another breath. Man, I just love the old school shrieks and screams from James Hetfield when he was 20. Which yeah, James and Kirk were 20, Lars was 19, and Cliff was 21. To also put things in perspective, March 11th, 2024, the day this video comes out, James Hetfield is 60, Lars Ulrich is 60, Kirk Hammett is 61, and Cliff Burton would have been 62. No Remorse really shows the age in Hetfield's vocals at the time, and I think they're great. Seek and Destroy. One of the riffs that made me really want to play guitar. I hear this song and I picture middle school, people headbanging and sinking, chilling, and Sting coming out to whoop some ass. In my opinion, this is the catchiest song from Kill 'Em All, and now just by talking about it, it's stuck in my head. And the last track, Metal Militia. The closing track for Kill 'Em All and very fitting. Ending the album with a chaotic thrash anthem that's amazing. I once was corrected by a Tom Cruise looking bastard and told that it was pronounced Metal Melita. It's not. Literally screams Metal Militia. I mean, one could interpret that it's Metal Melissa by hearing it. And while I agree my Aunt Melissa likes heavy metal, why would Metallica write a song about her when she was only five years old? Now that would be weird. This song is epic. The screams and echoes of Hetfield's, the solos from Kirk, the drums going ape shit from Lars and that bass snippet from Cliff, and the marching, it all... Ah. 
It's all great and it leads to a banger of an album closer. Also, that Dave Mustaine stuff that I was talking about, he has four writing credits on this album, two on Ride the Lightning, and claims that he also wrote stuff on Master of Puppets. Really? How long are you gonna keep this Tom Cruise joke up for? It's not even that funny. Wow, you were really late with that intrusion. You should have stopped me when when you had when I made when you you know when I made the joke, you know, I just uh, I what the hell are you even doing here, Elliot? You reboot b and Metal Talk Monday and don't even invite me back, and you call me Tom Cruise like you did in Star Trek September, and plus we already did Metallica. Like, look. Hmm? So today we're going to be talking about, uh... All the Metallica studio albums, and we're just going to basically talk about what their opinion, what we think about them, and just how they're... We rank them for our favorites. Okay, even so, nobody's gonna remember that. Plus, the camera quality was bad. We half-assed it. Oh, just like you half-assed the Deep Purple video. Regardless, uh, since you're here, you want to help me review Ride the Lightning? I mean, I can. This album came out in 1984, a year and two days after Kill 'Em All. Ride the Lightning is eight songs long and is about 47 minutes and 26 seconds long. The tracks are Fight Fire with Fire, Ride the Lightning, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Fade to Black, Trapped Under Ice, Escape, Creeping Death, and The Call of Cthulhu. Fight Fire with Fire starts with the clean tone before unleashing the mayhem. There's that silky build up that gets you excited and then boom, it hits like a ton of bricks. There's themes of destruction and it's just a banger. Ride the Lightning, the title track of the album, one of my favorite Metallica songs. The song is about getting the electric chair. Ride the Lightning is a song to get your blood boiling and your head banging and a raging- I don't think you should finish that statement. I was going to say a raging good time. No, you weren't. You were going to say- And any one of some kind of related- It wasn't even the window. It was a funny lead on. I'm looking back and this is funny. It's funny here. It doesn't weird, make any I sense. I completely agree. For Who the Bell Tolls. This is a classic head binging anthem. Starts off with that bass intro that a lot of people confuse with the guitar. This is a chilling, haunting symphony about war and death. Fade to Black. Oh man, I want to talk about Fade to Black. Oh. Uh, go ahead. Fade to Black, probably my favorite track off the album. It's everything you want in a Metallica song, starting off with that eerie acoustic intro, and then Kirk comes in with that epic guitar solo. Metallica wrote this song after their gear and equipment was stolen in Boston, Massachusetts, which made them cancel their show that night and postpone the European tour. I love how the song ends with that heavy dun -dun 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 part, and then that guitar solo end is like one of my personal favorite guitar solos of all time. Trapped Under Ice. This side of the album now feels like the tracks merge together for some reason to me. That doesn't make any sense. Shut up. Trapped Under Ice has a great chorus and simple lyrics, so let's go under the iceberg and see what they mean. Boo. Is this song merely a narrative of entrapment beneath the frozen boundaries of ice? Or does it delve into the profound solitude of the human condition? As the melody unfolds its haunting tale, one cannot help but ponder, are these verses a depiction of physical confinement or a metaphor for the echoing cries of an isolated soul? With each melancholy note, the weight of existential yearning seems to deepen like heavy chains dragging the spirit into the abyss of loneliness amidst those chilling harmonies of unsettling questioning lingers. Does this composition resonate with the silent screams of longing unheard and unacknowledged by a world indifferent to its plight? In the haunting refrain of this enigmatic composition, one is left to grapple with the unsettling truth of their own solitary journey, lost amidst the shadows of introspection and loneliness. Dude. Uh, that was... Oof. That was some heavy shit. Escape. This is like a part two to Trapped Under Ice. We escape from the suffering loneliness. Bruh. Escape was written inside the studio because the label wanted an extra track on the album, so James Hetfield said. This song is about living your life your own way. It's a pretty simple song to just jam out to, but not the best the album has to offer. Creeping Death. I love Creeping Death, but I always lump it with Trapped Under Ice and Escape. I think of the three songs as a three-parter. I mean in the literal sense. You could be trapped in a frozen lake, escape, get hypothermia, and death would creep upon yeah, you. Yeah, that would be cool if this was Children of Bodom, but that's not even close to what's going on. It's actually about ancient Egypt and the ten plagues. Are you just gonna argue with everything I say? Call of Cthulhu. This is the longest song on the album. It's about nine minutes. It's also an instrumental. I know Cthulhu is spelled with a K in this case, but I swear on my old iPod from back in the day, it was spelled the normal way. That's strange. The song is about calling upon Lovecraftian creature of Cthulhu. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic entity created by writer H.P. Lovecraft, first appearing in the short story The Call of Cthulhu, published in 1928, described as an ancient monstrous being with a humanoid form. Cthulhu is part of Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, an universe 
populated by otherworldly creatures and cosmic horrors. Cthulhu lies dormant beneath the Pacific Ocean in the sunken city of Ryla, awaiting the time when it will awaken to wreak havoc upon the world. Its mere presence induces madness and terror in those who encounter it. Embodying the theme of existential dread prevalent in Lovecraft's works, the character has since become an icon and symbol of cosmic horror and has influenced on popular culture, inspiring numerous adaptations, references, and homages in literature, film, and other media. And that has been Red Lightning. It's a great album. No, I completely agree. Hey, you want to review Master of Puppets with me now? Well, I'm kind of done. Don't you want to share your thoughts about Master of Puppets? It's pretty cool. Anything else? Uh, I'm kind of done. And what, do you want to hang out for a little bit? What the fuck? Yes, we all know Eddie Munson played Master of Puppets in Stranger Things. I mean, I never watched the show personally, but because I'm a metalhead who wears a battle jacket and has long hair and is a big nerd, of course people tell me about it all the time. I mean, even before that song was played on the show, I really didn't care for it anyways, just because I've heard it too many times. It's cool and all. But let's focus on Master of Puppets as a whole, released in 1986. There's eight songs on the album, and the songs are Battery, Master of Puppets, The Thing That Should Not Be, Welcome Home Sanitarium, Disposable Heroes, Leper Messiah, Orion, and Damn It Jake. Another eight-track album. No, not cassette. Literally eight songs. The full runtime is about 54 minutes and 52 seconds. Battery. Starting off with another clean intro. I do like this intro a little better than Fight Fire with Fire, but it's just about the same idea. Kinda like when Metallica plays live and comes out to Ecstasy of Gold from the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's an epic build up into the chaotic thrash madness. And Battery does just that as being pretty awesome album intro. <sighs> Master of Puppets. Everybody knows this one. It's one of their signature songs. Bum. Bum bum bum. Like I said, I don't care for this song, mainly because I've just heard it so many times. I've heard this song is about drug use, but my personal interpretation was that it was about oppression and political bullshit. Whatever it's about, it's one of Metallica's biggest hits and definitely one of their top tier songs to play live. In fact, Metallica has performed Master of Puppets over 1,742 times as of the making of this video. The thing that should not be seems like to be another song devoted to Cthulhu. With lyrics like he watches, lurking Working beneath the sea in crawling chaos underground, Colt has summoned twisted sound. It's hard not to make this assumption. It's a cool song, a little bit slower than what we're used to, but it's pretty good. The solo is also pretty chaotic and melodic. Pretty chaotic and melodic. Chaotic and melodic! Welcome home, Sanitarium. Metallica just has a formula going on. Epic songs to start the album, and by the fourth song, it slows things down with an awesome ballad with unique heavy parts. Welcome Home Sanitarium is probably my favorite song from this album. It has themes of mental institutions, and it's what you'd hear in a padded room while you're alone with your thoughts about- Don't start this shit again. Don't you have somewhere to be? Leave me be. What the fuck? Disposable Heroes. This is a pretty intense song about war. Soldier boy made of clay, now an empty shell, 21, only son, but he served as well, bred to kill, not to care. Who just as we say, finished here, greetings, death, he's yours to take away. Did somebody say soldier boy? No, also Shrek, what the fuck? Hello! Yo Shrek, wanna review Master of Puppets with me? What is happening? I need to lock my door. Leper Messiah. Bow down to the Leper Messiah. According to songfacts.com, it's a song dealing with Christian televangelists who use a person's guilt to con them into paying money. By promising people their safety with donations, televangelists keep the money for themselves. I really dig this track. It sounds so angry but simple and also telling you something with deep-rooted messages. It's not a warning, but rather just giving you the perspective. Not saying that all Christian televangelists are this way, but don't act like you've never seen this before. Orion. Orion is another long instrumental, but this time it doesn't take the last spot of the album. It's 8 minutes and 28 seconds, which sounds long for an instrumental piece, but it's so good. Definitely worth listening to at least once, even if you don't like instrumentals. And bits of Orion can be found scattered throughout other tracks on Master of Puppets. So think of it like the universe having scattered pieces that all come together in one place. 
kind of cool. Damage Inc. It starts off symphonic and slow, but then just pummels the fuck out of you with aggression. Another song with the word fuck in it, and you can tell this track ain't fucking around. Fuck it all and fucking no regrets. Never happy ending on these dark sets. It's a pretty fucking awesome album closer. Not their best, in my fucking opinion, but it's a close third behind fucking Dyer's Eve. Then fucking Metal Militia, and then fucking Damage Inc. Unfortunately, this would be the last album to feature Cliff Burton, because less than six months after the release of Master of Puppets, Cliff Burton tragically died in a bus crash in Sweden. The bus driver claimed that there were patches of black ice that caused the bus to slide off the road, while James Hetfield believed the bus driver was intoxicated. Regardless of how it happened, the world lost Cliff Burton at only 24 years old on September 27, 1986. Jason Newstead then joined as the new bassist for Metallica and was featured on their next album. And justice for all. It's not the first album to feature Jason Newstead, that would be Garage Days Re Revisited, but we're only doing studio albums here. Also, Jason Newstead was in other projects like Flotsam and Jetsam and his own solo projects, which by the way, Newstead's solo projects are pretty awesome. If you don't believe me, go listen to As the Crow Flies. And Justice For All. Released on August 25th, 1998, And Justice For All released as Metallica's fourth studio album. Remember when I said Jason Newstead was the new bass player? Well, you can barely hear the bass on the album. That's why he looks so pissed in the booklet. And yes, that's just a joke. Although there's no bass, I do love this album. There are nine songs, and the album is about 65 minutes and 25 seconds. Songs are longer than usual this time around, and if you owned it on vinyl, it came with two records for side A, B, C, and D. Now let's get on to the music. Blackened. Blacken kicks off the album with a bang. It's a fast-paced thrash fest with heavy guitar riffs and intense lyrics about the world falling apart due to environmental damage and impending doom. And Justice for All. The title track is really epic. Clocking in at almost 10 minutes, it's a roller coaster ride through the flaws of the legal system and societal corruption. It's got everything from intricate musical twists to powerful vocals. Eye of the Beholder. This one's all about fighting against conformity and societal control. With aggressive riffs and pounding rhythms, it's a real anthem for individuality and resistance. I always think of the classic Twilight Zone episode with the same name, One. You can't talk about Metallica without mentioning One. The lyrics tell a gut-wrenching story of a soldier trapped in his own body after war, begging for release. The Shortest Straw. The Shortest Straw is a whirlwind of thrash goodness. It's fast, it's furious, and it's all about the paranoia and injustice for being singled out unfairly. Harvester of Sorrow. This takes you to the darker side of human emotion. With its brooding atmosphere and heavy riffs, it's like a descent into madness and despair. The Freight Ends of Sanity. This one's a bit of a trip with its progressive vibes. No, not car insurance, that's just stupid. The Freight Ends of Sanity dives into mental instability and existential crisis, all wrapped up in complex musical arrangements. Personally, it's my favorite song from the album, believe it or not. The Live Is To Die. This is a beautiful instrumental track that pays tribute to Metallica's late bassist, Cliff Burton. It's haunting and reflective, a moment to pause and remember. The instrumental is 9 minutes and 49 seconds. There's no words needed until the very end, and very few are spoken. I don't want to spoil it. Go listen to it. It's hauntingly beautiful. Dyer's Eve. Closing the album with a bang, Dyer's Eve is a full throttle blast of anger and frustration. It's about breaking free from parental control and dealing with psychological scars. It's my favorite Metallica album closer. And Justice For All stands as a pretty great album. This is right before the band really broke out mainstream. Despite the notable absence of bass, which by the way, if you own a spar camp and you find the Metallica and Justice For All setting for bass, it's absolutely nothing yet. I just find that hilarious. The album's impact remains undeniable. Clocking in in over an hour, it showcases the band's musical ambition and willingness to push boundaries. From the explosive opener Blackened to the haunting instrumental tribute to Live Is To Die, each song just delves into themes of societal injustice, personal struggle, and emotional turmoil. With its blend of thrash intensity, melodic depth, and thought-provoking lyrics, and Justice For All remains a timeless classic in Metallica's discography. And I'm just gonna say this now in case nobody notices, I took all the bass settings off of the microphone while recording this part. <laughs> Rebooting system, rebooting system, rebooting system, rebooting system. 
Released in 1991, the Black Album is 12 songs and 62 minutes and 31 seconds. While every Metallica album up until this point didn't go above 10 songs, the Black Album isn't their longest album. That would be the one after this. Enter Sandman. The album opens with a haunting exploration of nightmares and fear, painting a vivid picture of the darkness that lurks within the subconscious. This is truly the beginning of the Metallica pop era. Whenever I hear this song, I just want to slam some beers and bash a kendo stick over someone's head. Sad but true. This track delves into the depths of human nature, shining a light on the darker aspects of the human psyche and the struggles we face within ourselves. Metallica sold out, it's sad but true. Nah, I'm just kidding. Holier than thou. With a relentless energy, this song critiques hypocrisy and self-righteousness, challenging listeners to question their own beliefs and actions. The Unforgiven, number one. Slowing down the tempo just a little bit, this ballad delves into themes of regret and redemption, inviting listeners to reflect on their own past mistakes and the possibility of forgiveness. Kinda reminds me of Stephen King's The Dark Tower series. And it kind of also starts with that ecstasy of gold theme, which Metallica is known for doing their concert. I don't know if I said this earlier in the review, I think I did. Wherever I may roam, with an adventurous spirit, this track celebrates the journey of life and the freedom to explore new horizons, encouraging listeners to embrace the unknown with courage and curiosity. Don't tread on me. This defiant anthem champions independence and resilience, urging listeners to stand tall in the face of adversity and assert their right to self-determination. Through the never, exploring the concept of confronting the unknown, this high-energy track propels listeners on a thrilling journey of self-discovery and personal growth. Again, nothing else matters. With tender guitar melodies and heartfelt lyrics, this ballad speaks to the power of love and trust, reminding listeners of the importance of staying true to oneself and one's emotions and nothing else matters. Of Wolf and Man Drawing inspiration from nature, this primal track celebrates the untamed spirit within us all, encouraging listeners to embrace their instincts and unleash their inner strength. Again, I've heard some people say that this song is merely about werewolves, but there's definitely something deeper going on. It's not about werewolves. The God That Failed. With a somber tone, this song explores the complexities of faith and the consequences of blind devotion, inviting listeners to question their beliefs and seek understanding. Again. My Friend of Misery. Delving to the depths of despair, this track explores the struggles of living with inner demons and the search for inner peace and solace. Again. The Struggle Within. Closing the album with a powerful message, this intense track reminds listeners of ongoing battle we face within ourselves, urging them to confront their inner struggles with courage and determination. Again. So let's get this straight. There's not a single bad song on this album. But if you listen to the first four Metallica albums and then this one, you'll notice a big change in pace. The Black Album is probably Metallica's best mix album, but to me, a lot of it is generic. You have 12 tracks that follow a very similar tempo with radio-friendly sound and catchy hooks. There seems to be less aggression in this album as well and all the songs kind of just blend together. Honestly, I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh, Metallica sold out, this album wasn't metal enough. Because bands can do what they want, honestly. Who gives a shit? But when every song on an album is played to death and you hear that everywhere you go, it gets annoying real fast. Other than those complaints, it's still a solid mix. Now, I feel like Metallica kind of falls from grace. After the Black Album, we're getting into what the fuck type of categories. While there are good songs after the Black Album is over, it's definitely going to get weird. So let's just dive into that head first. Load. Released in 1996, Load is Metallica's longest album at about 78 minutes and 59 seconds. The album is more in touch with hard rock elements rather than thrash metal. There are 14 songs, so let's get into it. Also, yes, the album artwork is semen mixed with paint or blood or whatever, but that's why it's called Load. Ain't My Bitch, the opener to the album. It's pretty catchy and it gets you moving. 2x4. There's a great continuation going on here. The last song just flows right into this one. Similar in riffage and two songs in a row that are just full of yeahs! The house that Jack built. And now the album goes into Alice in Chains mode. It's a good song, it's just very generic. Until it sleeps. I love those guitar tones in this song. Trippy clean mixed with dirty heavy. Every song so far has had catchy pop metal slash hard rock hooks very radio friendly, but it's still good music. It's not unlistenable, if that's the right word in the sentence. King Nothing. When that intro starts, you think of a few things like White Zombie, Rob Zombie, Alice in Chains. What you don't think of is Homer Simpson driving a monster truck through a field of grilled cheese sandwiches, because that's ridiculous. Uh, King Nothing. It's definitely interesting though. Lots of shreddy shred and chuggy chuggy. You break your pingus! Hero of the day. The bass in this song makes me think of bullfrogs. We're five songs in and I'm honestly getting tired of the easy catchiness at this point. And this is coming from a Lordy and Kiss mega fan. I love the breakdowns in this song though. 
bleeding. Slowing down again, there's a thorn in James Hetfield's side and it makes him feel yeah! Halfway through the song, Metallica takes a trip to Bikini Bottom, and at one point towards the end, it sounds like Lars Ulrich attempting to strike a lighter and it doesn't work so he slams it down on a trash can. Cure. Somebody please cure me of this dread. I'm stuck in radio rock hell. To be honest, the songs are not terrible. The album so far is solid, it's mixed well, but it's just so damn generic and it seems phoned in, just like this section of the review. But it must get better than this. Poor Twisted Me. I hear this and I think of Rob Zombie covering a Leonard Skinner song. It also makes me think of Alexa Bliss. Song is creative, but definitely not my favorite from the album. Wasting my hate. I'm wasting my hate on this album. Honestly, this song's the closest to the thrash era than anything, but it's doing that background riff to Ain't My Bitch just slightly different. That was my issue with the Black album. A lot of the riffs and instrumental bits sound so similar and flow together as one big thing. I love all types of music, but my favorite Metallica stuff is just the frantic thrashy bullshit, not hard rock. So don't think I hate hard rock. Mama said, Mama, she has taught me well, told me when I was young to stop ripping off Leonard Skinner. This song sounds country? Honestly, I don't hate it. I actually love country and bluegrass, so fuck off about that. But what's weird is, sounds like 2010's country music over everything, so this song is kind of ahead of its time. It also sounds like some of Weird Al's originals. If you know, you know. Thorn Within. This song was very forgettable to me. It's got cool riffs and shit, but it's at the point now where I'm just tired of hearing catchy hard rock Metallica songs. Jesus Christ! Ronnie. First Metallica write a song about my Aunt Melissa, and now my Uncle Ronnie. Nah, just kidding. Why the songs on the second half of the album lean more into honky-tonk rock and roll, I'll never know. But the song is interesting. It sounds like Monster Jam video game background music or Farming Simulator. So I guess it does make you think of Homer Simpson driving a monster truck through a field of grilled cheese. I never really thought of that. Wow, well, moving on. The Outlaw Torn. This is the last and the longest song on the album at 9 minutes and 49 seconds. One of my least favorite album closures by them because Dire's Eve, Call of Cthulhu, and Damage Inc. exist. But this is another song by Metallica that just reminds me of the Dark Tower series. In 1997, a year after Load was released, Metallica released Reload. And as you guessed, Load and Reload are pretty much a two-parter. They go hand in hand like salt and pepper, oil and vinegar, Kool-Aid and water, or in some cases, shit and piss. I honestly prefer Reload, if I'm going to be honest. First Metallica released an album with semen on it, and now nuclear ass cheeks. Nah, I'm just kidding, it's actually just piss and blood. You wanna see why they actually call it Reload? Ah, okay, okay, I'm getting to the review. Reload is 13 songs in about 76 minutes and 4 seconds. Fuel. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me double jet design! This song is a classic. It's overplayed to death, but it's still good. The memory remains. I actually love this song. I remember WWE using it for WrestleMania 28. Wow, I've mentioned wrestling a lot in this. Let's just go over real quick Metallica in relation to WWE and get it out of the way. And no, I'm not talking about how Hulk Hogan lied about auditioning for Metallica. Sandman used Metallica's Enter Sandman as his entrance theme for most of his career in ECW. Sting used Metallica's Seek and Destroy as his entrance theme in World Championship Wrestling and All Elite Wrestling. St. Anger is the official theme song for SummerSlam 2003. All Nightmare Long is the official theme song for No Mercy 2008. The song was also also used to promote the winner takes all world championship unification match between the Universal Champion Roman Reigns and WWE Champion Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 38. The Memory Remains is an official theme song for WrestleMania 28. My Savage is an official theme song for WrestleMania 33. Now that we're dead was used as the Undertaker's entrance music prior to his Boneyard match against AJ Styles at WrestleMania 36. Sad but True was in WWE 2K23. Also, I believe it was Triple H who used For Whom the Bell Tolls at WrestleMania 27. And one time I forgot to bring my theme song to an indie show and had to come out to creeping death and another time I came out to Four Horsemen. Okay, that's enough to talk about wrestling until we get to 72 seasons. Devil's Dance. The bass intro is heavy and sweet, and then it starts with yeah and it's followed by generic rhymes, but overall the overall tones in the song are pretty cool. The Unforgiven 2. Uh, why does this exist? Unforgiven 1 was amazing. It didn't need a part 2. It's like the Never Ending Story Part 3 or the whole fucking Iron Eagle series. It's kind of like Dark Tower when uh, I'm just referencing the same shit too much. Oh, kinda like this up. So anyways, it's actually a good track. Fans are indecisive of which Unforgiven is the best. I don't know, what's your favorite? Yes. 
you, the person watching this video. According to viewer retention, most people would have clicked off the video by now. But if you're still here, comment which Unforgiven is your favorite. No words, no explanation, just put the number in the comments. Let's confuse the people who only watch for 20 seconds and I click off. Don't give a reason, just comment one, two, or three. I'm really kidding, nobody's watching at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Better than you. Killer pop hard rock. Solo's cool, but the song doesn't make me feel good about myself, it just makes me feel embarrassed. Slither. This one has King Nothing vibes. It's similar in a lot of ways. The hey's and the yeah's have truly gotten old for me. Remember, I'm listening to every Metallica album multiple times in a row to take notes to form the script for this video. Ugh. Carpe Diem Baby. Seize the day. Makes me think of Dead Poet Society. Also, I get a lot of Megadeth vibes from this song. Bad Seed. Another intro with that bass, yeah yeah, and other cliches load and reload and have done to death up until this point. If I were ever hanging upside down and being severely tortured, this song would be played because it would work. Where the wild things are. Great book, but what about the song? Well, it sounds like Alice in Chains collabed with Korn and had James Hetfield sing it. Uh, let's talk about something else now because I'm tired of complaining how many times I've heard the word yeah. So, bees, known for their extraordinary characteristics, possess five eyes and six legs as typical of insects. Within the hive, male bees fulfill the role of drones, while female counterparts except for the queen bee are known as worker bees. Remarkably, the queen bee showcases prolific egg-laying abilities, reaching up to 2,000 eggs per day. Fortunately, the loss of a bee stinger leads to its inevitable demise. With a history spanning almost 30 million years, bees have established themselves as an integral component to the Earth's atmosphere and ecosystem. Their ability to transport pollen, utilizing specialized structures in their hind legs called pollen baskets or corbiculae. Corbiculae. Okay, okay. Corbiculae, it's vital to their pollination efforts. Each beehive on average accommodates 50,000 bees, where foragers need to visit about 2 million flowers for one pound of honey. Yet, despite their small size, forager bees contribute significantly, producing about 1 12th a teaspoon of honey throughout their lifetime. With an average honey consumption of 1.3 pounds per capita in the United States, bees remain essential not only for honey production, but also for their crucial role in pollinating approximately 130 agricultural crops, thereby adding an estimated $14 billion annually to an improved crop yield and quality through their pollination activities. Prince Charm, is this the son of King Nothing? Well, I had Shrek on earlier, so I'd like to bring him back to talk about this song. Ahem! Listen up, you sorry lot! Gather around and let me tell you about the blight upon our kingdom. That smarmy overrated Prince Charming. Prince Charming thinks he's all that just because he's got a fancy title and a shiny suit of armor. But let me ask you this, what's he done to deserve it, huh? While real heroes like yours truly are out there fighting dragons and rescuing damsels in distress, this dandy prince is probably off getting his nails done or practicing his royal wave. And don't even get me started on his hair, all floofed up like he's some kind of fancy poodle. It's a disgrace, I tell ya. A real man doesn't need fancy hair to prove himself. He needs guts, courage, and a heart as big as a dragon's cave. But Prince Charmin, he's got none of that. He's just a pretty face with a whole lot of hair. I do like the drums in this song, though. They're going apeshit compared to the guitars and bass, and I think it would make a cool Guns N' Roses song. But as for Ch Prince Charming, Shrek the Ogre of all ogres is here to lay the smacketh down on that princey pris- Prince pr fucking prissy Prince Charming. You see, this ain't no fairy tale. This is real life, and in real life there's only one King of the Ring, and that's me. Charming, you may think you're all that with your fancy hair and your shiny armor, but let me tell you something, buddy boy. You're about to meet your worst nightmare. I'm going to stomp you into the ground so hard they'll be singing hallelujah from here to far, far away. So buckle up, buttercup, because Shrek's coming for you, and there ain't no happily ever after for you. Just a one-way ticket to Painville! Okay, okay, shut the fuck up, Shrek. Low Man's Lyric. Interesting song. Contains a hurdy-gurdy, which is a hand-cranked wheel fiddle. Honestly, this might be the best song from Reload. It's Metallica Cottage Core, but also, it's pretty deep. I haven't heard this level of depth in a Metallica song since the Black Album, which is saying a lot. The trash fire is warm, but nowhere safe from the storm, and I can't bear to see what I've let me be so wicked and worn. Someone has truly hit rock bottom and is going through some hard times. Attitude. The song's pretty heavy. Well. Yeah, I guess it would be if it's by Metallica on a Metallica. I mean, and overall, it's, uh, 
The song's okay. It's catchy, it's... I don't know how to say this properly. It's too pleasing on the ears and predictable? Okay, I'm weird with Metallica, okay? Again, I Fixer. think that... I actually dig this song. It's the last one on the album. It's odd how this song is the album closer. I mean, it's good, but I wouldn't have made it the final track. Lyrically, Fixer explores themes of redemption, betrayal, and the struggle for personal salvation. The song's lyrics have been interpreted in many ways, with some suggesting it reflects the band's own internal conflicts and struggles. I don't know. But tell me, can you heal what father's done, or fix this hole in a mother's son? It's an okay song. Trash fire is warm, and my pain is brew. Finally, I'm done with these loads of shitty, piss, bloody, nut fucking stuff, and we can move on to Death Magnetic. But Van, you missed one. Mm, no, I didn't. Here, catch! What the fuck? Okay, you know what? Saying anger isn't as bad as people say it is. No, no, fuck that. Let's just talk about Saying Anger. No, seriously. It's not as bad as people say it is. Saying Anger is Metallica's eighth studio album released in 2003. It's 11 songs in about 75 minutes and one second. This album took the band many years to make. The documentary Some Kind of Monster is about to lead up to the album and is honestly worth watching if you're a fan of the band. And it's better than the album. Now, Saying Anger is regarded as Metallica's worst album. And while I agree with some people's standpoint, it's actually not as bad as everyone says. The main issue is just that goddamn trash can drum. But Alica went the route of new metal, which again was their choice. I think fans get way too mad about artists changing their visions when it has nothing to do with them. Also, Jason Newstead is now out of the band, and Bob Rocks, the band's producer, plays the bass for this album. While Robert Trujillo joined the band after St. Anger was already mixed, even though he's playing bass in the music video. Honestly, there's fixed versions of St. Anger without that annoying snare. Just look up St. Anger fixed drum on YouTube, and while you're at it, look up Metallica and Justice for Jason. You won't be disappointed. So I will just burn the versions of St. Anger's fixed drums on a CD and listen to it that way. Oh, hey, hey Lars. <laughs> I wasn't talking about taking Metallica music for free. Well, listen, I mean, first of all, um, um, uh, um, it's this um, continuity um, error. <laughs> Frantic. Opener of the album. You'll immediately notice the trash can drum, and to be honest, it fits the tone of the song. The song is, well, brand tick 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 tock and angry. I like the chorus though. You'll also notice the absence of guitar solos on this album, starting with this song, Saint Anger. This song is interesting to listen to with headphones. They really mix the instruments in odd pan places. Do you know what I mean? In case you don't, panning instruments is done in a way to make it sound like the instruments are in different positions, as if it were being played in front of you. The mix has the drum in the center, like usual, but then they kind of swoop it in. It's hard to explain. Again, I don't mind this song. It's got the word fuck in it several times, which we haven't heard in a Metallica song in a while. See, the songs Frantic and St. Anger were good choices for song 1 and 2 because they're actually enjoyable, compared to other tracks that will come later. You flush it out! You flush it out! Some kind of monster. There's a lot of muddy guitar work here that cuts in and out. I thought my CD was skipping and this brand new CD player I had just shit the bed. The title Some Kind of Monster was said by the band when they said they wished they could pick all the bass players that auditioned for Metallica and combine the best parts of each one of them into Some Kind of Monster. I've also heard the song got its name because Hetfield said the song was like Frankenstein. But also, I asked my friend what the hell this thing was without him knowing what the song was and he said, I don't know, Some Kind of Monster? So who knows 100% where the name came from? Probably not Emilio Estevez, because why would he? Oh wait, he went to school with Robert Trujillo? I... <sighs> Damn it, now that joke doesn't work. I specifically looked up Emilio Estevez and Metallica because I was sure there were no... Overall, I think the song is badass, kind of. Except the line, this is the end that will never end, because for a second I thought James said this is the yeah that will never end, and it about sent me into a catatonic rage. Dirty window. Now we start to go a little downhill. The trash can is going ape shit, and the themes are kind of stupid. The first three songs didn't rely on it this heavily, but just enough. So the first three songs were kind of a tease into thinking the rest of the album is like this. Dirty Window would have been better without the trash snare from hell, but it's just a decent song, honestly. Invisible Kid. This is a killer riff, but yet again, the sound of someone fucking Optimus Prime's big fat metal ass cheeks ruins it. The rhymes in this song are just pure cheese. Invisible kid, never see what he did, got stuck where he hid, falling through the grid. How about instead you should have written, Invisible kid, he would be really pissed if he saw what you did by writing cringe shit. The song does have a great message, but it's executed very weirdly. 
Bridge is pretty cool though. My World. This song is interesting. I like the pacing of it, honestly. I've kind of drawn to it. Look out motherfuckers, here I come, I'm gonna make my head my home. And it's my world, sucker. It's pretty catchy. I love how crazy on the vocals Headfield goes later on. He starts screaming differently like he never has. And then that breakdown. God, it feels like it only rains on me. It's it's good. See, like I said, this album is an absolute dog shit. With Frantic, St. Anger, Some Kind of Monster, and Now My World, it's four songs out of 11 that are actually pretty solid. Shoot Me Again. The intro is pretty promising, and then Metallica goes in a system of a down mode, and this song's pretty fun. It's very loose feeling and just a new metal groove. I love the unpredictability of the song. Most of the time, you can predict Metallica pretty well with their drum fills, their riffs, their melodies, but this one... This one was an exception. Also, if you made it this far into the album, the beer keg drum starts to kind of grow on you. I'm just going to go ahead and say this is my favorite track on the album so far. Sweet Amber. Is this a love song or something? No, hardly. It's supposedly about alcohol addiction. Sweet Amber is an interesting song. The song has only been performed live one time in 2004. It's tied with Fixer, Mama Said, To Live Is To Die, and Escape, as each song has only been played once live. Metallica's least played songs from every album are Metal Militia, 95 times, Escape, once, Orion, 76 times, To Live Is To Die, once, The Struggle Within, 20 times, Mama Said, once, Fixer, once, Sweet Amber, once, Suicide and Redemption, twice, Man Unkind, twice. Where were we? The Unnamed Feeling. This song is... great! It's so melodic, it's headbang worthy and groovy while being heavy in tone and lyrics. Why is it song number 9? It comes alive, it comes alive, it comes alive, and I die a little more. The unnamed feeling is so catchy, the song is perfect in representing anxiety. Personally, I go through depersonalization issues. And this seems like the rap- Hold, hold on. I'm listening to it on YouTube at work, and I just got interrupted mid-song by a fucking Reese's Cup commercial. <sighs> the song helps explain my depersonalization issues and how I try to explain it to people who don't understand. Get the fuck out of here, I just want to get the fuck away from me. I rage, I glaze, I hurt, I hate, I hate it all. Why? Why me? There's like a mini guitar solo in here, and I haven't really addressed this yet, but I'll say it now to get the poser comments and the hate going. Metal music includes guitar solos, and I'm a fan of solos, but it's not completely necessary for every metal project to include them. They're cool, they're nice, and as a guitar player, I really appreciate them, but you don't need guitar solos to make metal music. Now I'm just gonna go with saying, The Unnamed Feeling is my pick for the best song on the album. Purify. Now this is easily the worst song on the album. How did we go from the actual best to the actual worst? What the fuck happened? This song is stupid. Purify? More like snareify. <laughs> what the fuck? There were... <sighs> this is where song placement is really important. You can't put goofy shit after a killer song. Now I know Metallica realizes this because sometimes at concerts they play entire albums in reverse order of the pre-selected songs. So if they do Master of Puppets, they'll start with Damage Inc. and then end with Battery. But anyway, if I heard Purifier before the Unnamed Feeling, it would probably have been better. As dumb as hell as that sounds, all within my hands. This is the 11th song and the closing one for the album. The intro starts off and it reminds me of Pac-Man. And then Pac-Man is tossed inside a dumpster and somebody clubs him over and over again until he's fucking dead. This has some intriguing bits sprinkled throughout. But again, song placement is important because I wouldn't have made this the final song of the album. And again, saying anger isn't garbage. It's honestly underrated and overhated. You just don't like it because as a diehard Metallica fan, it's not something you expected. Which is fine. Doesn't mean it's complete shit. Or maybe it's the fact that it's an easy target and metal elitists can't help themselves. It's not better than their classic albums, and it's not great, it's not a masterpiece, but it's not dog shit. Not a perfect album, but I like it more than Load. And now we can get to Death Magnetic. Death Magnetic is an album I rank very high. Why, you may ask? Well, think of it as Metallica's return. A return that happened after the unfortunate failure of St. Anger, the pop rock elements of Load and Reload, and not having a good track record amongst metal elitists since the Black Album. Until Death Magnetic, Metallica were kind of a laughing stock. I mean, did it help that they chose the artwork that looked like shit stains being flushed inside of a toilet bowl? No. But album artwork doesn't define the album's sound. I mean, Dance of Death by Iron Maiden looks like PS1 beta graphics, but that album is solid in terms of heavy music. Honestly, I kinda like this album cover. And the way The Grave keeps digging as you're flipping the booklet. 
it's really cool. What's not cool is why they decided to put the songs in the wrong order inside the booklet. It's like how the songs on this Kiss final I own are out of order. Wait. Maybe Metallica did something cryptic here to give you a different outlook if you listen to the songs in this order? Nah, I think I'm thinking too deep about it. Alright, let's just get into the nitty gritty. This album came out in 2008, has 10 songs, and is about 74 minutes and 54 seconds. But I'm gonna warn you about this right now. This album, despite me praising it, has the worst Metallica song ever written on. Oh yeah. But before I can tell you about that, I gotta tell you about this. Also, is this the White Album? <laughs> What's next, the Yellow Album? That was just your life. Kicking off Death Magnetic with a thunderous roar, Metallica grabs you by the collar and throws you headfirst into a wall of heavy rips and raw emotion. Aw, oh, fuck yeah. Metallica and the thrash gods that they are 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 back! The end of the line. With its relentless tempo and searing vocals, this track is an adrenaline rush from start to finish. While it might not be everyone's cup of tea, its unapologetic fierceness makes it a standout of fans who crave that raw, unfiltered Metallica sound. Broken, beaten, and scarred. As someone who's weathered their fair share of storms, like everybody watching this, this anthem of resilience hits home. It's a defiant reminder that our scars are a testament to our strength, and that we're truly never beaten as long as we keep forward. Our pain, we need it. It's what makes us who we are. Oh yeah, and speaking of testament, the day that never comes. From its haunting opening notes to its explosive climax, this song feels like an emotional roller coaster. It's a powerful exploration of betrayal, forgiveness, and the fragile threads that bind us together. The intro kinda reminds me of testament. That's why I said speaking of testament. All Nightmare Along. With its eerie atmosphere and relentless energy, this track feels like a descent into madness. It's a chilling reminder of the darkness that lurks within us all, and the nightmares that haunt our deepest fears. Clinging to us like a... Hold on. Elliot, where the hell are you? You're supposed to interrupt me. Cyanide. With its blistering riffs and driving rhythm, this song feels like a toxic addiction just coursing through your veins. It's a cautionary tale of the dangers of getting caught in a downward spiral of self-destruction. Also, why does everyone hate this song? The riff is SOS and Morse code when it starts off, and it's a fun bop. Maybe the song is longer than it should be, but other than that, it's fun. The Unforgiven 3. Building on the legacy of the predecessors of the Unforgivenses, this song feels like a journey of self-discovery and redemption. It's a deeply personal reflection of the scars we carry and the healing power of forgiveness. A bet. But, 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 motherfucking but. It's my least favorite Unforgiven. And with that said, it's still not bad. It's just I prefer one, two before this one. I still think it's good. When are we getting Forgiven? The Judas Kiss. With its searing guitar solos and defiant lyrics, this track feels like a battle cry against betrayal and deceit. It's a reminder that sometimes the greatest revenge is simply refusing to be broken by those who seek to destroy us. Suicide and Redemption As the only instrumental on this album, this track feels like a missed opportunity. It lacks the emotional depth and the intensity of other songs, and other instrumentals they've done. Falling flat in comparison, this is a drag. This song takes a while to get started and it just goes nowhere. At three seconds shy of ten minutes, just... What the fuck? I'm not opposed to Metallica's long instrumental tracks, but I don't have the patience for this one. My Apocalypse. Closing out the album with a burst of raw energy and aggression. This track feels like a... Feels like a good release of emotion. It's a reminder that even in our darkest moments, there are always a glimmer of hope waiting to be found. And... That's cool. <sighs> Honestly, as predictable as this album is, and not the best mixed album ever made, I appreciate for what it is. I forget what song it is now because I was taking notes and not timestamping like I should have been, but I thought my wife changed the player over to Pearl Jam, so I wish I could remember what moment of which song it was, but I don't feel like going back, but I missed the opportunity to make a good joke about Pearl Jam. I would dab yeah. Yeah, that's been Death Magnetic. Next up on the list is Hardwired to Self-Destruct, Metallica's album from 2016. Another album that is disliked and ranked low, but again, I liked the album. Better than Death Magnetic and everything past the Black album, honestly. Oh look, I fixed the continuity errors. Hardwired to Self-Destruct. 
This album was released in 2016 and is 77 minutes and 42 seconds. It's split into two CDs even though you could fit it all onto one. Minus the deluxe edition so it comes with three discs and different artwork. I think the point of the two discs was so that you could have the ability to listen to songs in different order, as we previously discussed. Honestly, I think the artwork is kind of dumb, but again, it's about the music here. Let's get into the tracks. Hardwired. This is a furious blast of thrash metal right out of the gate. Hardwired sets the tone for the album with its relentless kick-ass energy, aggressive riffing, and rapid-fire lyrics. It's a punch to the balls that grabs you from the first note and doesn't let you go until the last. Atlas Rise With its infectious riff and soaring melodies, Atlas Rise is a standout track that harks back to Metallica's classic sound while still feeling fresh and vital. The dynamic shift between the verse and the chorus keeps things interesting, and the guitar work is epic, it's just the icing on the cake. I love the catchiness of this one. Now that we're dead. Built around a massive chugging riff and a pounding rhythm section, Now That We're Dead is a powerhouse of a song that showcases Metallica's trademark blend of aggression and melody. That chorus is tailor-made for arena sing-alongs, making it an instant crowd favorite. Moth Into a Flame This is a blistering assault of thrash metal fury. Moth Into a Flame is driven by its relentless pace and razor-sharp riffing. The lyrics, inspired by the dangers of fame and addiction, add an extra layer of depth to the song, while the explosive chorus is guaranteed to get heads banging. Dream No More This is a little dark and atmospheric. Dream No More is a brooding behemoth of a song that oozes with menace and intensity. The crushing riff, the haunting melody, the it just creates a sense of impending doom, while James Hetfield's vocals soar above the chaos, delivering some of the album's most memorable lines. Halo on Fire Halo on Fire is a masterclass in tension and release. The haunting verses gives way to a soaring chorus that sticks in your head long after the song has ended, while that intricate guitar work adds depth and texture to the arrangement. Confusion This is a relentless onslaught of aggression and angst that just about copies Am I Evil at first. Confusion is a relentless assault on the senses that grabs you by the throat and refuses to let go. First song by the balls, this song by the throat. The crushing riff and pummeling drums just provide that perfect backdrop for Hetfield's impassioned vocals. While the lyrics explore themes of war and mental anguish with unflinching honesty. Man Unkind. We focused on The Undertaker and now Mankind. Yeah, I know I said I would have the wrestling references for 72 seasons and I wouldn't make any of them, but I couldn't help myself. This is dark and atmospheric. Man Unkind is a brooding epic that combines elements of thrash groove and progressive metal create a sound that is uniquely metallic. The haunting melodies and atmospheric production give the song a kind of otherworldly feel. I know this isn't everyone's favorite song from the album, but I think it's pretty decent. Here Comes Revenge, a dark and brooding anthem of vengeance and retribution. Here Comes Revenge is a relentless onslaught of crushing riffs and pummeling drums that grabs you by the throat and refuses to let go. I am... Wow. All work and no play make Jack a dull boy. I'm just writing the same thing over and over again. Oh, just like Metallica? The lyrics inspired by themes of betrayal and justice delivered. Ugh, sorry, I just, I've been writing the same thing. It's a good song, go check it out. Fun fact, I was looking at Revenge merch and then this song came on, so... It was kind of ironic, but time, I don't... Am I Savage? Moody and Atmospheric. It's a brooding epic that combines elements of thrash, doom, and progressive metal to create a sound that is uniquely metallic. Oh boy. Um, not my favorite from the album, but it's it's a good it's a good one. Um, oh, I'm getting burnt out. Murder One, a fitting tribute to the late great Lemmy Kilmister from Motorhead. Murder One is a high octane rocker that pays homage to Motorhead's iconic frontman with its diving rhythms, blistering guitar work, and raw blistering guitar work. Raw energy. <sighs> the lyrics inspired by Lemmy's life and legacy are delivered with passion and reverence by Hetfield. Well, the infectious groove, heads banging, fist pumping. A lot of people shit on this song, but but I think it's great homage to Lemmy. Spit out the bone. A relentless barrage of thrash metal fury. Spit out the bone is a high speed ride. Tempo, lightning fast riffing, pulverizing drums. Exhilarating listening experience. Dystopian lyrics. Apocalyptic imagery. This is my favorite song from the album, honestly. I think they saved the best for last. But wait. There's one more. Isn't there? Let me double check. Lords of the Summer, which is on the deluxe edition. Let's not get into it. I'm finally done with this. I just, I'm, I'm burnt out on the Metallica stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Finally done. And I can get back to listening to black metal. No. Uh, well. 72 seasons. Why is Hulk Hogan trapped behind bars? Help me, brother. Okay, all jokes aside, let's just pop it open. Uh, uh. 
Uh, now, what? Bro, what is this? A damn origami project? Okay, finally. 72 Seasons is Metallica's 11th studio album and the final album that we'll be discussing today. It came out last year in 2023 and is 12 songs, 77 minutes, 14 seconds. Songs are 72 Seasons, Shadows Fall, Screaming Suicide, Sleep My Life Away, You Must Burn, Lux Eterna, Crown of Barbed Wire, Chasing Light, If Darkness Had a Sun, Too Far Gone, Room of Mirrors, and In Immorta. And I warned you now, this album is very predictable, especially since I just listened to every album multiple times. Why am I saying this? Nobody watches this far into my videos. 72 Seasons. We're starting off with amazing hi-hat work, chugging, and wild riffage, and a very promising sound. I like the age of Hetfield's voice. But this song kinda sounds like Hardwire Leftovers to be honest. It's not bad, I'm just very burnt out on the predictability, long songs, wah solos, and mainstream sound now. Shadows follow. It's a very predictable intro. I do like the chunkiness of the bass on this track. This song could actually belong on the Black Album, believe it or not. It's got that same kind of style. Screaming Suicide. Minus the intro solo, this kinda starts off like the other two tracks. <sighs> How many times do I need to say this? I wish I wouldn't have listened to all of the albums in a row so I could appreciate it more. And the chorus we've been is kind of interesting. Sleepwalk My Life Away. I don't know whether to call this the Yellow Album or the song starting with S Album. But whoa, holy shit. That bass intro. Chunky and groovy as fuck. Those guitar sounds mixed in with that kill switch button and string scratching was also a decent surprise. The chorus starts with Should I fall, I fall down? Would you come, you come round? And this sounds so new, but yet familiar. I can't place where I've heard it before, but I actually like this song a lot. You Must Burn stereotypical Metallica intro again. It's making it harder for me to separate which song is which at this point. This kinda sounds like sad but true, but a little doomier. Halfway through the song though, the bass picks up and it's such a headbanging time. Lux Eterna. I remember hearing this as a single before the album came out. I mean this album had like four singles, but this is the only one I heard. And I was shocked that the rest of the album wasn't this speed. It's a nice fast track, it's 3 minutes and 22 seconds, which is a good break for the overly long songs. Hey, what? Crown of Barbed Wire. Something I've been thinking of wearing in my entrance for wrestling. And uh, stop talking about wrestling. This is Metal Talk Monday. This isn't Sportswire Radio. This is another song that feels like old school mix wouldn't do. At this point, Robert Trujillo is the star of the album. I've been enjoying the bass just most on, on 72 seasons, to be honest. I also like the lyrics in the song. I still think Sleepwalk My Life Away is my favorite track, but this is a close second. And guess what? Uh. Chasing Light. There's no light! Song's okay. I've only listened to a few Avenged Sevenfold songs, so don't come at me. Don't come at me. I just haven't listened to much of them. But for some reason, this reminded me of them. Bad example? Probably. But this song was decently good. Darkness Had a Sun. Nice chuggy, heavy, headbangy bop. The drum fills in the song are very weird to me. A few songs I noticed on this album have unnecessary drum fills throughout other songs, but this is this one is weirdly timed to me. For a second I thought I was listening to Suicidal Tendencies the way Hetfield's voice shifted. It sounded like Mike Muir. And I'm sure Robert Trujillo would appreciate that, because he was on some of my favorite suicidal albums. But yeah, this song is pretty cool. I prefer the second half of it. Too far gone? A uh, predictable intro again. I swear I've heard this build up at least a hundred times by now. I do like the vocal performance here, but again, I've just been sucked in by the bass. And then there's like this Iron Maiden bridge and I just fell in love with it. Room of Mirrors. This song, moi, instant classic. It's so different, but yet familiar. Not necessarily a super heavy song, but that doesn't matter. It was really good. It definitely in my top three for the album so far. I replayed this one a bunch, but we have one more song to go. In Immorta. This is the last song on the album and Metallica's longest song in about 11 minutes and 10 seconds, so damn it. At least when it's over, I don't have to listen to Metallica until their next album comes out. Well, I listened to it. Starts off stereotypical, but the bass bobbling along makes it cool. And the drums are repetitive. Sounds like the sad end of a love gone sour. But you know, honestly I got 5 minutes in and I didn't even realize it. It didn't seem like the song had gone that far. At about 5.40 in there there's some part with this chunky bass and some somber guitar tone and a ticking hi-hat and oh fuck it's 5.40. <clears throat> this lasts until about 6.40 and that wail mixed with the dueling guitars is a ah, chef's kiss to be honest. This is one of the longer Metallica songs that just zooms by. It was really great. What a cool ass way to finish the album. 
it honestly doesn't even feel like 11 minutes. And I feel like that's how a lot of long songs should be. Honestly, at first I regarded Hardwired to be their best recent release of the two, but now I gotta say I like 72 Seasons just a bit more. So how about I do like a quick ranked album, worst to best? Oh, and if you haven't guessed yet, it's based on my weird ass opinion. And with that being said, you're probably gonna get pissed off at me. 11. Load. Fuck, I really didn't have a good time with this one. Good songs, but overall, just don't like this album. 4 out of 10. 10. Reload. I like this album better than Load, and at some point I might create a custom playlist with songs only from Load and Reload and call it like D-Load or something stupid like that. 5 out of 10. Number 9. The Black Album. Well, it's time to get crucified. I think it's Metallica's best mixed album, and there's really not a bad song from it, but I'm so sick of it. God damn. It's honestly like a 7.5 or an 8 out of 10, but I can't ever escape it, so it's 9th on the list. Number 8. St. Anger. Underrated and overhated. I love this album. Great riffs, shitty drums, some stinkers and songs. 6 out of 10. Is it better than the Black Album? Fuck no. But good thing about it is, it'll never follow me everywhere I go. 7. Hardwire. Solid return, some duds here and there, but it was a much needed album. 6.5 out of 10. 6. Death Magnetic. Solid album. Again, has only one really bad song. I think it's a strong return from the band, but it wasn't enough. And it took way too long to 1. Come out and B. Follow up. Great album though. 7 out of 10. 5. 72 seasons. A little bit better than Hardwire. I was in disbelief when I heard people say that, but I completely agree. 7 out of 10. 4. Master of Puppets. A fucking classic. Sure, some songs are overplayed, but I like the ones that aren't even better. Everybody knows it, so what else can be said? 8 out of 10. 3. Kill em All. Bro, I can't get enough of this one. I just go back to it more than Master of Puppets. That raw, hardcore punk thrash mayhem is just... <laughs> Hell yeah, that's some classic shit. 8.5 out of 10. 2. And Justice For All. This album is a fucking masterpiece. It's brutal as hell, but there's no bass. It always feels like it's missing something, but there's not a single bad song on it. 9 out of 10. And number 1, Ride the Lightning. My absolute favorite Metallica album. It's what I started with, and it's what I continue to go with. This is an album that I never skip any songs from. 9.5 out of 10. Okay, now we're finally done talking about Metallica, and to be honest, I'm really burnt out on the band. But with that being said, what's your favorite song and album? Am I a non-metalhead for liking St. Anger? Do I suck because I hate Load? I'm sure I'll get crucified in the comments, but I'd love to read what you have to say. From the origins of the band to the 2024s, I'm very confident that I've covered everything I want to talk about when it comes to Metallica. So until Season 2 of Metal Talk Monday, which I'm leaning towards the end of the year, that's been all from me. Until Season 2, Metalheads.